13 billion dollars spent, 66 billion trees planted, yet most died in China's grand fight against desertification. While the official story celebrates ambition, the results are stark. 85% failure, escalating erosion, and deepening poverty. But at the very same moment, in the lowest plateau, a smaller investment, just $500 million, transformed 35,000 square kilometers and lifted 2.5 million people out of poverty by working with nature, not against it. Why did the nation's colossal campaign fail where a patient ecological approach succeeded? The answer reveals a costly lesson hiding in plain sight. In 1978, China launched the Three North Shelter Belt program with a vision that stretched across 4 million square kilometers, an area larger than India. The strategy was simple, plant trees, stop the desert, and green the north. Officials set their sights high, promising to plant tens of billions of trees, by some counts over 60 billion saplings in just a few decades. The ambition was matched by the budget, more than 100 billion yuan in central funds by 2010, with additional spending from provinces and counties. In dollar terms, that is well into the tens of billions of dollars. 3 North But the results on the ground told a different story. In the dry heartlands of Inner Mongolia, Gansu, and Ningxia, rows of poplars and willows shriveled under the sun. Survival rates often fell below 20%. In some regions, field surveys found less than one in five trees alive after just a few years, entire belts reduced to dead trunks and dust. The root of the problem ran deep. Poplars, chosen for their quick growth and easy planting, demanded water and fertile soils that northern China simply could not provide. Annual rainfall in many project zones hovered below 400 millimeters, far less than poplars need to thrive. Drought stress set in almost immediately, with saplings wilting by the first summer. Local species adapted to sparse rain and poor soils were passed over in favor of uniform, fast-growing imports. Survival. The incentive structure behind the campaign only made things worse. County officials were evaluated by the number of trees planted, not by how many survived. Subsidies flowed for hectares covered, not for long-term growth. Once the planting quotas were met and the paperwork filed, Maintenance and aftercare lagged. In Hebei and Shanxi, audits uncovered poplar plots abandoned as soon as subsidies ended. In some counties, up to 75% of newly planted trees were neglected within three years, left to wither as local governments chased the next round of targets. The focus on quick wins and visible numbers created a cycle of planting and abandonment, with little regard for ecological fit or sustainability. Subsidies then came the beetles. The Asian longhorned beetle, a pest native to the region, found a buffet in the endless poplar monocultures. By the early 2000s, outbreaks swept across millions of hectares. In Liaoning and Shandong, entire windbreaks collapsed as beetles bored through the stressed, water-starved poplars. Local forestry reports described mortality rates reaching 85% in infested belts, with trees dying faster than they could be replaced. The lack of diversity meant that once the beetles arrived, nothing stood in their way. Monocultures turned the shelter belt into a single, vulnerable target. Monocultures By 2010, the toll was staggering. Billions spent. Tens of billions of trees planted. But in many of the driest regions, more than 70% of those trees died. The campaign became a lesson in what happens when ambition outpaces ecological reality. China attempted to engineer its way out of desertification by fighting nature with scale, speed, and uniformity, and it ran headlong into the limits of climate, soil, and biology. The result was a living laboratory of failure, paid for with over a decade and billions of dollars in what some now call China's most expensive ecological tuition. Wind-carved hills stretch across the low S plateau, their soft yellow soil cut by a maze of gullies. For centuries, this region in north-central China has been shaped by the push and pull between people and the land. The Laos itself, fine powdery dust blown in from distant deserts, once formed some of the world's richest soils. But relentless deforestation, overgrazing, and farming on steep slopes stripped away the protective cover. 
Each summer storm sent torrents of muddy water racing through the gullies, carrying the land itself downstream. By the early 1990s, the plateau was losing an estimated 1.6 billion tons of soil every year, more than any other region on Earth. The Yellow River, once a lifeline for northern China, became infamous for its burden of silt. Every year, over 100 million tons of sediment poured from the plateau into the river, making it the most sediment-laden major river in the world. Floods swept downstream, forcing levees higher and threatening cities and farmland hundreds of miles away. The river's nickname, China's Sorrow, echoed in the lives of those who depended on it. For families living on the plateau, the crisis was personal. Fields shrank as topsoil vanished, and harvests grew more uncertain with each passing year. Incomes hovered around $70 per person annually, barely enough to survive. Crop failure was common, and many villages relied on emergency food aid to make it through the winter. The land that once promised abundance now trapped its people in a cycle of poverty and loss. The gully network spread wider each decade, cutting through villages and swallowing roads, homes, and hope. Children grew up watching their parents struggle against dust, storms, and barren slopes. With every rain, more of the plateau washed away, and the prospect of a better life seemed to disappear with it. This was not just an ecological disaster, it was a human one. The connection between soil, water, and survival was stark. When the land failed, so did the livelihoods built upon it. The Loess Plateau's collapse became both a warning and a question. Could a landscape so deeply scarred ever recover, or would the erosion continue until nothing was left to lose? On the Loess Plateau, the answer to catastrophic runoff was neither high-tech nor new. It was terraces, horizontal steps carved along the contours of the hills. For centuries, farmers in China and beyond have used terraces to slow water, catch soil, and make steep land farmable. But in the 1990s, local technicians and villagers took this ancient idea and applied it on a scale never seen before. Each terrace begins with careful measurement. Workers mark out lines that follow the natural curves of the hillside, not straight lines down the slope. The result is a series of benches, each just wide enough for crops or fruit trees, cut into the yellow loess. The inner edge is often reinforced with a small bund or stone facing, while the outer edge gently slopes to prevent collapse. By breaking up the slope, terraces turn a single, fast-moving sheet of water into many small, manageable flows. Rain soaks in instead of racing away. Soil stays put, and crops can grow where erosion once ruled. This is not just engineering for engineering's sake. The new terraces came with contracts. Households received secure rights to their improved plots, creating a direct incentive to maintain the benches and keep them productive. Payment and support were tied to outcomes, stable terraces, healthy crops, and reduced runoff, not just to how many meters were built. Villagers became partners in the process, not just laborers. Over time, the pattern reshaped entire hillsides. Where once water carved deep gullies after every storm, now it slowed, spread, and seeped into the ground the land could finally hold on to the rain. In the hands of local communities, gravity became an ally, not an enemy. Terraces gave the plateau a new texture, and with it, a new chance. Gullies cut deep scars into the Lus Plateau, channeling every rainstorm's fury and carrying away the land itself. For decades, these gullies were written off as lost ground, too unstable, too dangerous to reclaim. But restoration teams saw opportunity where others saw ruin. Their answer was the Czech Dam, a simple earth and stone barrier built across the gully's path. Not one or two, but tens of thousands, forming a dense network across the plateau's most eroded watersheds. Each Czech Dam works with gravity, not against it. When floodwaters roar down the gully, the dam slows the flow, forcing water to drop its heavy load of loess. Over seasons, sediment piles up behind the dam, turning once raw ravines into flat, fertile silt fields. In some valleys, these new dam lands stretch for hundreds of meters, fresh ground created by the very erosion that once destroyed it. The process is self-reinforcing. 
As one dam fills, water slows further upstream, letting the next dam in the chain catch even more soil. This lattice of dams re-engineered entire catchments. Instead of flash floods carving deeper and deeper channels, water now seeped into the ground and sediments stayed put. The land behind the dams became valuable cropland, with soil moisture nearly double that of the old slopes. Grain yields on these new flats outpaced even the best terrace fields, turning the gully bottoms from hazards into breadbaskets. Behind every dam stood a crew, local farmers, engineers, and water conservation teams working through summer heat and winter cold, sometimes by hand, sometimes with bulldozers. Their labor built more than physical structures. It built trust that the land could recover. The Czech Dam Network did not just stop disaster. It turned the plateau's greatest threat into its greatest resource. Restoring the Les Plateau meant more than reshaping landforms, and it depended on what grew back. Instead of blanketing hillsides with a single species, teams of agronomists and local seed collectors scouted for plants that had always belonged to the region. Grasses like Stipa and Lamus, with roots as fine as thread but as tough as wire, were sown first. These grasses could take hold in the powdery loess, anchoring the soil within a season and outcompeting weeds. Shrubs such as Karagana and Sea Buckthorn followed their deep roots reaching for scarce water and their branches sheltering young shoots from wind. Where the land allowed, fruit trees, apples, jujube and walnuts were planted in careful rows, but only on terraces where rainfall could support them. This approach was patient, shaped by decades of hard lessons. Every hillside was different. In the driest gullies, grass alone was enough to hold the slope. On north-facing banks, where moisture lingered, a mix of shrubs and trees could survive. Seed collectors gathered from wild stands, ensuring new plantings matched the genetic memory of the plateau. County technicians tracked which species thrived and which failed, adjusting mixes year by year. Funding was tied to results, not just to hectares planted. Plots that stayed green and rooted earned continued support. The impact rippled outward. As native cover spread, birds and insects returned, pollinating crops and controlling pests. The land began to recover its resilience, with each species playing a part in holding water, stabilizing soil, and restoring fertility. Where earlier monocultures had collapsed under drought and disease, these tailored plantings endured. Survival rates climbed, often four times higher than the failed poplar belts to the north, because the land was no longer forced to accept what it could not sustain. Instead, restoration worked. With the climate, the soil, and the memory of what belonged. Satellite images tell the story in color and contour. Where barren yellow once dominated the Loess Plateau, green now spreads across the hills, an arc visible from space. Over 35,000 square kilometers, restoration efforts have doubled, and in some places even tripled, perennial vegetation cover. In 1999, less than a third of the plateau supported living plants, by 2019, that figure had climbed above 60% in many regions. Hydrologists tracking these changes use NDVI, an index of vegetation greenness, to measure recovery. Nearly every monitored valley now shows a steady upward trend, confirming what locals see on the ground. Slopes once stripped bare by wind and rain are holding onto life again. But the transformation is more than just a shift in color. River gauges along the Yellow River have recorded a sharp drop in sediment load. Each year, more than 100 million tons less silt flows from the plateau into the river than before restoration began. This is not a rounding error. It is a measurable, basin-wide change confirmed by decades of sediment station records. As terraces and check dams slowed runoff and native grasses anchored the soil, the river's notorious burden of mud began to lighten. Water that once ran brown now carries less of the land away. Groundwater, too, has begun to recover. Springs that dried up in the worst years are flowing again in some catchments, a sign that rainfall is soaking in, not just running off. The Loess Plateau's ecological turnaround is no longer just a hope. It is a documented fact, written in satellite pixels and river data alike. A family in Gansu once survived on less than $1 a day, their harvests shrinking as each season stripped more soil from the fields. After terraces and check dams arrived, 
the same land began to yield steady crops. Secure land rights turned erosion control from a government order into a personal investment. With each season, more grain filled the storerooms and orchards planted on new terraces brought in cash from apples and walnuts. Incomes doubled and then tripled, rising from $70 per person to $200. For the first time, families could afford to repair their homes, send children to school, and buy livestock. These gains were not isolated. Across the Laos Plateau, more than 2.5 million people moved out of poverty as a direct result of the restoration projects. The transformation was not just social, it was economic efficiency on a scale rarely seen in development work. The combined cost of the two main World Bank-backed projects came to $500 million. Spread across the 2.5 million people who crossed the poverty line, the investment worked out to less than $200 per person. For that sum, entire communities traded a future of dust and hunger for one of secure food, stable income, and hope. Economists point to the lowest plateau as proof that ecological restoration can be a bargain not just for the land, but for the people who depend on it. In a world where poverty and environmental loss often go hand in hand, the Loess Plateau stands as rare evidence that healing the earth can also heal lives. Today, global land degradation threatens nearly 3 billion people. That is proof that restoration is not just possible, but urgent. The Loess Plateau stands as living evidence. Respect ecological limits and even devastated landscapes can revive. As restoration projects multiply worldwide, one lesson remains clear. Nature does not negotiate. Our future depends on whether we work with or against the only system that sustains us. Thanks for watching.